Hey, everybody. It's a percussion podcast. We're recording on February 2nd. My name is Casey Cangelosi. This is episode 217. And with me, as usual, are my co-host, Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. And Carly Vina is here. Hi, everyone. Ksenia Komjanovic is here. Hello. Hey, so how was the premiere, like your new group, which I think you pronounce NUMA? Is that right? Good job. Yeah, Silent Pete. All inspired by Tool. Um, it was great. Look at that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Nobody can see it. It's very blurry, right? That's probably the better. Um, it was fantastic. I was uh, really happy because this was a sort of a revival. All of these guys, or almost all of them, I met during uh, my time at the Frost School of Music. And the idea was to just keep that culture and that way of playing chamber music um, going outside of school, of course, and we had a wonderful uh, guest coming in. Um, he is a freshman at Frost right now, but is a child prodigy. And it was really amazing to work with someone who is 19 and just has musical and mental chops, spiritual chops as well, you know, to the sky and back. So um, it was amazing. It was really great to play with these guys, hang out with them. And we had a, a wonderful concert, a lot of really great reviews. So we were very happy with it. Is this the kid that likes my hi-hat piece? It is. Oh. He likes your hi-hat. He likes you very much. Yeah. <laughs> he's a genius. Right. He's a genius. Yeah. He's Clearly, he's a genius. John Kilkenny just said he's a genius. So I just... I'll let Antek know. Antek, did you hear that? <laughs> he's not there right now, probably. No, I, 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 I'm going to say, so he doesn't have great taste is what I'm hearing. <laughs> right. But he's a genius. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's a subjective art. Yeah, exactly. Well, hey, well, I've already, I just mentioned his name and he's our guest today. He's the director of the Swanee Festival, which you've all probably seen and heard about and he teaches just up the road from me at George Mason University directs the percussion ensemble uh, assistant band director yep. is that right mm -hmm. yep so conductor he's here today because we do a, like like a lot of y'all we do a annual concerto student concerto competition and it's my turn to have a representative from the brass percussion area and I thought well I, I need to have someone who'd be able to judge percussion and brass and at the time of course well i don't know if i'll even have a percussionist in the finals it turns out we do my student aaron awesome. Soforenko is going to play the ravel left hand concerto and i suspect just drink the blood of his enemies he's really <laughs> <laughs> so yeah poor john has to judge what i imagine is going to be a fierce competition tonight and uh go oh, you went to temple you went to juilliard yep. mm -hmm. um let's see swanee george mason and man we'll get it's into enough, everything yeah. else That's, is that enough <laughs> plenty, well yeah. thanks so much yeah for, it's great for to being be here. here thanks for asking he's, me. he's sitting right next to me in my office and it's a joy to I've been in the area for five years, and we've never actually met face-to-face. -face. Yep. So welcome to the show, John Kilkenny. It's great to be here. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Look sure. To it. Yeah. Sure, sure. Ben, do you have a question, or should I ask John something? Yeah, yeah. so well, it was funny when Ksenia was talking about her, her new group and all the wonderful people she'd met in school and playing together. It reminded me, I wanted to ask John about two people that I know he went to school with and see great. what they were like back then and <laughs> know Strauss. where they are now. So one <laughs> one is uh, our, our friend and teacher, Matt Strauss. Excellent. And the other is, I think you went to school with the, the famed wind band composer, John Mackey. Am I correct? I did, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Both of those guys. Yep, absolutely. Oh, geez. All right. Yes, the yeah. people that are very famous, right? So that's yeah. cool. So what was Matt like? Matt, Matt is pretty much the same way he is now. He's actually... Um, probably mellowed a little bit like we all have with age, you know, um, but, but uh, you know, the same really dedicated, driven, smart, savvy person that we see in the profession now is, is sort of the same way he was when I, when I knew him, I actually met Matt. We, I went to Aspen when I was in, um, in high school. And so I met Matt there. He was, I think in his second or third year going to that festival. And I was my first summer there. So that's where, where I first met him on a bus and uh, going up to the, the music building. And and um, we've been friends and, and colleagues ever since. I just talked to him the other day, a couple of days ago, about some students and some other things. Um, but yeah, the, he's pretty much the same way he is now. Um, embarrassing story? or Embarrassing stories about Matt. There are plenty of embarrassing stories about Matt. And when I come back and my career is completely over and I'm totally out of the industry, I'll be happy to tell you. All of those embarrassing Matt Strauss stories. Yeah, but, but, uh, okay. 
We're think, all about the gossip on this show. So. I, I understand. Yeah, I'm trying well, to think of what to, I could tell. We need to um, do something to survive because we've booked <laughs> Evelyn Glennie, and she is also starting a podcast. So I suspect uh, this is the end. This like, might, the end is, I'm going to close your podcast down. Yeah, <laughs> we, have to, we have to do something. This might be a podcast you can dig up dirt you see on. all the terrible things I could say about that. No, yeah, never, obscure the, percussion. He's like, always been just you know above board, never yes. done anything questionable. Um, neither have I. I've, I've never, you know, we've never done anything bad. Matt's always been <laughs> perfect in every way. Um, and as long as I have students auditioning for Rice, that will be the story that I will tell. <laughs> um, and then you mentioned Mackie too, right? Uh, J John, John Mackie. Mackie. Yeah, I, I, John and I, I, I played a lot of John's music as, as a lot of percussionists do with composers in school. He really started um, not as much in wind band as he did in... Um, uh, with dance, right? And his early works are really for were for a choreo comp, and he did a lot of work oh. uh, with a guy named Robert Battle, who's now um, the artistic director of Alvin Ailey. Um, so Robert and John and and I, and amongst many other people, were all in school at the same time. And so Juilliard has this uh, program called Choreo Comp, where uh, young choreographers and young composers get together and collaborate on on works, and then those works are premiered um, on a special concert and. Um, John and Robert worked together and that sort of the, the, the that created a lot of other work after that initial collaboration. Um, I think John's first and I, I might be wrong about this, but I think his first really well-known band piece was Strange Humors, um, which he actually wrote for String Quartet in Djembe initially for Alvin Ailey oh. or for was it? No, it wasn't Ailey. It was um, Paul Taylor. I did dance oh. company in New York. And I on that concert, there were several other pieces that I that I played. And so um, that was sort of where John first cut his teeth on all of this was with with dance and with choreography. And then I think he arranged, not arranged, but he transcribed or wrote Strange Humors for Wind Band. I, I don't remember who commissioned it, but that kind of launched his yeah. his uh, trajectory in the Wind Band world. And now, you know, he's known mostly for, for, for that uh, area, but um, definitely, you know, started with dance and, and actually has some great music for orchestra and some great, great chamber pieces that should probably get more attention. I say that without any uh, you know, financial advantage for me, but there's a lot of work that John wrote, uh, has written for other other genres that I think should get, get yeah, played. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Is there a... I have no embarrassing stories about John either. He's also much calmer now than he was when, when he was a kid. Should we start over? That's <laughs> too <laughs> Better start over. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything bad about anybody on the podcast. Oh, so. I mean, I will. I'll say bad things about things but what probably not about people <laughs> is you john want... is john mackey probably the most <laughs> successful self-publisher do we think he seems guys, to have started it right i mean it I don't seems know. like wildly successful yeah. i mean he's to, to run that sort of operation all yourself and to manage everything and... it seems like he created his own um which now a lot of other people have have uh, modeled modeled and joined yeah. in on but yeah he was kind of the f part of the first group of composers to come out of Juilliard. I mean, Jonathan Newman is another one. That Steve Bryant's another one. Of course, Eric Whitaker is probably the most oh, there you go. sort of that might be a... may, maybe the most, I don't know if yeah. I would say the most successful. I mean, they're all four of those guys are wildly successful composers yeah. in their own, in their own way. Um, but yeah, John definitely has led the self-publishing sure uh, like field. It. Yeah. It's yeah. great. Yeah. I, uh, Ksenia, I think. Um, I was really curious since we're going, we're doing throwbacks uh, first. Uh, I wanted to know about your uh, professors. So you studied with everyone and worked with uh, and played with, with Jonathan Haas to Alan Abel. Can sure. you tell us how they've influenced you and how they shaped your career? Sure. I mean, all of, of I, I've been really lucky and I, I've said this to students before that even going back to like my elementary school band director, I've never had a bad teacher. You know, and I think a lot of people can tell that story about like, you know, may maybe the person that they that influenced them because they weren't good. Right. So now they, they sort of made yeah. them into a different person. I never I'm very lucky in that I, I never had anybody um, who who I would say was a bad teacher in front of me. So all of the mistakes I made are, are, are my own. Right. I can't blame them on anybody else. Um, but, you know, studying with with Jonathan, I met Jonathan, um, who I'm going to see in a couple of days. I'm, I'm going to be up at NYU and um, on Tuesday. And I, so, but I met John when I was in high school. Our drumline teacher, this guy named Mark Lortz, who's now band director uh, one of the, uh, in Maryland, University in Maryland, um, at St Stevenson University is where Mark is. And uh, he was studying at Peabody. He was doing drumline. I came back from Swanee, where I'd gone as a student. 
And I expressed some degree of seriousness about all of this. At that point, I was like 15 or 16. And he's like, oh, you got to go play for my teacher, Jonathan Haas. And, and anybody that knows knows Jonathan, again, someone who has mellowed with age, but this is like, you know, 25 years ago. Um, so I unknow unknowingly drove to Baltimore as a 16-year-old kid to play for uh, someone who had a very large personality back then. Uh, yeah, and and it was, it was, but it was awesome. I mean, it was great. And so I worked with John in high school um, and then with in when I went to Juilliard with Greg Zuber is my was my primary teacher of course Dan Druckmann does the percussion ensemble there and so I mean I don't I think they were they're both really very different people and very different players but um have a, have a high standard of of uh excellence I mean I think you know there there's really no way that you could complain to Dan Druckmann about being busy or tired because he's the busiest and most exhausted person I know in the field. I mean, the guy just does everything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, had had uh, a, a, a very high standard for all of us that I think was was almost a mu as much of a goal, sort of an aspirational goal than really a uh, thing that anyone was ever going to achieve. Um, but, you know, we all did the best that we could. And it was a great, incredible experience to work with them. And then you know, I mean, what do you say about Alan Abel that hasn't already been said? Like, I mean, there's this, this legendary figure. Um, he's 91 years old. He's just recently stopped playing, yeah. which is in its <laughs> own way an inspiration. And, um, you yeah, know, I remember when I auditioned for him, uh, I don't know if this is even remotely close to what you were looking for, but when when I auditioned for him and, you know, you, of course, you know who he is, right? And it's like the, the weight of all of the people that have ever played for him before sort of sitting on your shoulders as you walk through the front door. And he walked up the basement from his basement in his little green sweater. And he said, hi, I'm Alan Abel. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, of course you're right. I know who you are. Like, I'm petrified to be standing here in front of you. Of course, I didn't say all that. I just said, hello, sir. It's nice to meet you. I'd love a cup of tea. I hate tea, but I gladly <laughs> drank it. I'll just um, do anything. You drink the it. tea. Um, yeah. But it, it was extraordinary. I mean, you know, I don't think there's, I think there are very, very few people in our field who have heard as many people play over as many years as Alan has. Right. You know, I mean, I'm sure we could go through and do a survey and think about, you know, there may be a couple others, but realistically uh, from, you know, I, we could name from even people that didn't study privately with him, but have gone to play for him and work with him. There's really nobody that has That's heard more so people play, right. you know? Yeah. yeah. And could tell you every, and worked with more conductors and could tell you the way that auditions have gone. I mean, there's just the amount of information you could get yeah. and we were able to get out of him was just extraordinary. So I know, I know Ted Agcass was, was working on a documentary. Right. I, yeah, I, I exactly. hope it's still going. I yeah. Mean, I'm not sure where that project is, but yeah, it's going to take years to do. I'm yeah. sure. So hopefully it's still going. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know Ted said the same thing. Like he, Alan Abel is one of the few people that uh, people consistently, I, I hear them say this again and again, that if he were to, audition again for his job he would get it again yeah i think he's one of the few yeah. people that it had had he had to do that he probably it's cool could have i mean there are, are others we could again sit here and name but i certainly, think it's a certainly. super small list i just hear that i just <laughs> yeah, hear that yeah. again and again yeah, you know like, like people make that comment with him you yeah know, for some reason and, yeah uh, no absolutely so i mean they influenced me just because like i think each of them had a different greg is a really great musician and so like i i think i learned a lot from him about approaching things musically and and I, I learned a ton from alan about how to play in an orchestra and also like just how to approach a a, a system for playing everything mm -hmm. right like there was just always even the things that you think about like i mean this guy spent hours thinking about how to play castanets like who does that you know but he did and he yeah. like had this really methodical system for how to play castanets which is awesome and like we all should think about castanets half as much as he did but right. um you know, so that approach, that really systematic approach. And John was, Jonathan was sort of my first introduction to um, that, a, a wider world of music. And, and you know, as a kid and living in Northern Virginia and thinking that the pinnacle of achievement was like district band, you know, or, mm -hmm. or whatever, to go to Peabody and to play for him and have him, you know, yeah. it was just a whole different range of things so to be exposed to. So you're from Northern Virginia? from Northern Virginia, oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then you ended up at Mason. I did. So yeah. you're home. I'm home. Yeah, I wow, never left my parents' that's... basement or anything. Like that. <laughs> I did that's do that. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah, no, it's worked out really well. Yeah, Casey, so. of interest, John went to James Madison High School. Oh, my God, University. Yeah. Oh. Yes, yes. So almost. <laughs> but, you know. 
we're supposed to be arch enemies, you know. We're like you can we're tell. Like, we're it's really toxic. <laughs> yeah, you can tell. I can hardly, I can hardly stand. Being Virginia's there. an interesting place yeah. though for percussion. If there's time, it would be kind of fun to talk about that. But I, it's not my, not my thing to control. But I it's wanna, an it's I an interesting vibe. That. But tell me, no, tell well, us. I want to okay. know. Okay. Yeah. Well, like I think growing up, and this this is not an indictment of anybody that's been in the state for a long time. I don't think anybody has been in the state for a long time. I think uh-huh. this is terrifying to say, but I might be one of the longer serving professors now in the state of Virginia, yeah, maybe me got, and Earl, right at Shenandoah. Earl Yowl, yeah. Earl's been there a little bit longer than me, I think, but not much. And we've um, got Rob Sandrill. Right, Rob Radford. Jenner Radford, yeah. We've got, I'm kind of just letting everyone know, we've sure. got Annie Stevens at Tech. At Tech, yeah. And uh, who am I forgetting? Justin Alexander at VCU. Oh, yeah, yeah VCU. Um, so the really cool thing, I think, of in, the nice thing in Virginia, if you're a, to put a shameless plug in for all of our schools, is that our programs are really different. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're not, none of us are really trying to copy the other person. So a, a kid that would be really, you know, a high school kid student or a graduate student that was really interested in coming and studying here and, and is into everything that you're doing and your mm-hmm. colleagues are doing is probably also not super interested in Mason. Right. right? Like we have a, our faculty yeah. profile is very different. Our programs are really different. And so I mean, you know, we're always seeing students, you know, I mean, how, how many students say, where are you auditioning? Oh, JMU and Mason. Okay, yeah. Right. We see, you know, or I see kids that are doing, you know, some students doing VCU, JMU and here. Yeah. But largely, if a student is really into coming to us, they kind of have a sense of what they want to do. They probably aren't interested in maybe composing for percussion. You know, the, the interests their areas are super different. They want to go, you know, to see an orchestra. They want to, you know, somebody that teaches and is in the Marine Band is going to be super appealing to them if they want to come study at Mason with one of the faculty there. So it's nice, be, or if they want a smaller program in, in Richmond, that that's a, a really great program, but, you know, uh, not as many students. Or um, what Annie does at, at, at Tech is great. You know, she's got a terrific setup there. Um, it's but been, we're not really kind of at each other's throats in it a way that other like places that. would it, be. Yeah. It, it feels really great. And I'm yeah. sorry if we're having our own little conversation yes. sorry, here. Guys. But, uh, <laughs> like, it's been really great. You know, you, you talk to students and sometimes they'll – you know, you're just talking with them and they let it fly. I'm auditioning here, here, here and there. Or you say, Where you, what, what's next for you? And they'll tell you. And like, it's been so easy for me to say when they say, oh, I'm auditioning at George Mason or I'm auditioning for Annie Stevens at Virginia Tech. It's been so easy to say like, oh, great. Tell Professor Kilkenny hi. Tell Annie Stevens hi. Everyone in the state is so cool. You've mm-hmm. got tough choices ahead of you yeah because like everyone is so it is such a i don't know it feels really good it does not feel contentious or competitive and i i can i can say that because i've seen other schools oh my gosh be that way you know there are other states i've been to i'm sure we've all i mean yeah where they are they won't even do like a day of percussion together this university does their own Mm -hmm. day of percussion and then they won't participate in the pas state day of percussion because they're a rival with the other school it's like uh yeah it's just wild i've heard stories about um some professors just very openly telling like if if, say a student's doing like three in-state schools right mm-hmm. oh you definitely don't want to go to that place you definitely absolutely don't want to go to school x yeah. and i cannot think i mean f- first of all i wouldn't say that because it's just like shady and un- unethical yeah um but more importantly like i, I just there, i i wouldn't never say that because it's not true in virginia i mean if a, if a kid yeah. really wants to you know go to any school that's not where I happen to teach, I'm. That's great. They're going to get a good yeah. education. There's good faculty there. There's good experience there for them. So it's sort of like an approach with a, a sponsor. Like when a sponsor says, you, you know, like sp- if they're smart, they don't say, "Oh, don't play Yamaha. It sucks. Don't play Marimba. One. It sucks. <laughs> right, right, right. Only play our gear." Right. They say like, "Oh yeah, those. Oh man, the you know the Yamaha 5100 series during this era was like." sounded like that you know we love that sound that's those are such good instruments you make yourself sound better <laughs> when you recognize the good yeah. in other yeah. other instruments and of course we're talking about the good in other schools and let's see do any y'all have a question well, i haven't watched the chat in about 20 minutes the chat's minutes been really so. funny i've been watching the thread go by. Oh, yeah, yeah. you have to be careful <laughs> i don't watching. think they have anything to do with yeah that. Chat, sorry if it was distracting no it's great i, I <laughs> yeah. gets people in a lot of trouble <laughs> well, I have a question. John, uh, sure. you were appointed artistic director of mm-hmm. the Sewanee Festival in 2018, right? Yep. Um, 
So as a teacher and as a performer and now as an administrator, um, one, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your role at Sewanee. And also, second part of the question would be, what kind of skills do you think are needed for a musician to be an effective administrator? Uh, sure. So um, I, I, let me see how, how concisely I can do this and not ramble on. So my primary job, I have two very distinctly different roles with the f festival and it's um one is mostly artistic and that's programming uh, the orchestras we have two orchestras at swanee uh, i'm ignoring the threat uh two <laughs> orchestras at swanee and um so i work with the con the different conductors we have with those orchestras to program the, the repertoire for for the student orchestras um and then we have a faculty chamber series and so then that's you know programming uh a seven concert series with our faculty um, of which other, you know, it's very, very little percussion. So um, that, that's that been kind of a, a whole other universe of repertoire to have to get into. And honestly, was the thing I was most worried about when I when I took the job is that, you know, it's an orchestra festival and the chamber music that we play is mostly around strings and winds, you know, strings, winds, brass, and then sort of percussion is, right. is, is on the series, but is not, you know, we're not going to play every week for a million reasons, not the least of which is, 60% of our, our students at the festival are string players, right? String players and pianists. Right. So, you know, we have to satisfy that. So that's actually the thing I was most worried about. And what has turned out to be the most rewarding part of the job for me is working with, you know, I have a small committee of faculty that, that we program the series together and kind of gathering all of the information from all the faculty about what they want to play and their recommendations and then seeing the ideas and, and kind of seeing the scope of what, you know, I didn't, no, and what I'm able to learn and has been really rewarding for me. And I think that's something that I'm grateful for the training that I had when I was younger, the fact that I went to music festivals and went to the schools I went to that were much more than just percussion schools. I mean, obviously, you know, I went there because of who taught percussion, but there were so many things I saw, you know, in my undergrad and, you know, chamber music concerts and new music concerts and, and then being in Philly and going, I mean, I think I went to hear the Philly Orchestra weekly almost the entire time I was there, the two years I was there, which I look back on that now and think, man, you know, could I wish I could do that again. You know, at the time it was like, oh, I got to go hear the Philly Orchestra again. Yeah. Like it was some kind of, you know, chore um, instead of a privilege that it, that it was and that it still is. So um, the orchestra programming part of the job has been easier for me because that's repertoire and literature that I'm very comfortable with. And usually when you're dealing with some of the conductors I'm dealing with, like, you know, Joanne Folletta is going to say, I want to do Scheherazade. And I'm going to say yes. And that's going to be the end of the conversation. You know, I'm not going to have a big, long debate with somebody yeah. at that level of the orchestra world about what she's going to what she's going to lead. Right. Or and that's true of, of most of the conductors. And then uh, or it's true of all the conductors. And then, you know, when the only thing I have to deal with there is sometimes they want to do something that might be either too difficult or they want to play too much music. And, and so it's kind of trying to shape them and guide them in a way that doesn't feel uh -huh. like I'm criticizing these figures in the field, right? So is that how the programs are determined? Yeah. Is, is it, okay, you're, you're the conductor, what do you want to, what do you want to bring to us? And then the program start, like that's the pretty much, I mean, there's definitely a repertoire that, you know, at most, uh, a lot of fe festivals program and uh, including Swanee program repertoire around recruitment, right? So you have nice. to think about what, a student wants to play yeah and what's going to get them to to apply and potentially pay you know a significant amount of, of money or their parents to, to come study there makes a lot of um, sense that, that reminds me real quick dave yeah. herbert chicago symphony orchestra yeah. told us his first time playing right of spring was recording it <laughs> you know with with san francisco I mildly terrifying yeah, yeah right yeah. And, and and just it it adds weight i think to your comment because He's saying that should not be the first time you 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 do that. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Should be with a major symphony orchestra. Hopefully, you've done it when you were a student. Yeah, you played it a few or... times, and yeah, had that experience. Wow, that is scary. So, so how do you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. So, Keep so that that's sort of the programming thing, and then like, we're I, one of the things I was really fortunate about was that the conductors that we have that have been coming to Swanee, by and large, get get what we're going for right and even in people that we're bringing in that are new to that like we have uh, jeff grogan coming this summer for the first time and jeff mm -hmm. is a highly regarded educator and does you know all the all states and regional i mean so he gets students and understands exactly what they need to do and so 
you know, it wasn't a difficult conversation really with any of the conductors to figure out what we do. Um, so I asked them to sit, recommend programs and they, they recommend what they want to do. And then, you know, sometimes I'll say that's great, but we'd also like you to do this or, you know, this will help complement that. But um, the orchestra programming is generally the easiest part of it. And then the chamber music thing is just a big conversation amongst the faculty and yeah. also thinking about what the students want to hear, what they need to hear, you know, if they're going to they're going to be there because they a student will come to a festival to hear their faculty, their, their, their teacher play a certain piece or collaborate right. chamber music in some way. I, I have a balance question. Um, you, you know, on one hand, you want to program pieces that mm -hmm. will attract students, like my Rite of Spring right. uh, analogy example there. But on the other hand, you probably have people saying we have to be more diverse. Yeah. We have to play. You have all the yep. composers saying, why do we have to hear Rite of Spring? Mm -hmm. Again, it does not need any of our support or help. How do you? Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's a huge issue. And I think that, you know, I, in a perfect world, we would have, you know, Swanee's four weeks. So that's four concerts, right? Mm -hmm. For each orchestra to program. That's n virtually no time, you know, to really come up with what, to try to satisfy, check all those boxes. For sure. So we, we've done a better job this year of, of having, um, uh, somewhat more diverse programming program offerings for the orchestra um, where we have more space to do that is the faculty concerts and the student chamber concerts mm -hmm. because there are just more there are more opportunities there to do that um, so we're we're leaning in there a little bit more with or quite a bit more with um, you know with diversity both in you know in, in gender and in ethnicity uh, for our chamber music and for our, our student chamber music programming but yeah it's difficult and I, I have an enormous sympathy for um, anybody that's trying to figure out what to do with the, with their programming, because diversity is important, inclusion is important, representation, it's a huge part of what we do at the music festival. We partner with other educational programs, the Atlanta Symphony Talent Development Program, Nashville Symphony and Cello Rondo Program, uh, Play on Philly, Austin Soundwaves, all these groups that work with generally underrepresented students in classical music. We have scholarship programs for them. We, we match scholarships that the organizations put up so that they can come to Swanee. Yeah. And then we want to make sure that they see themselves on the podium and they see themselves in the programming um, balanced with, you know, we got to play Mahler one, right? I mean, like right. <laughs> Mahler one's going to put, you know, students in, in chairs. Yep. And so um, it's, it's difficult. And I don't think anybody really nails it. The other half of my job is money, Carly, just to answer your question. The other half <laughs> of my job is money, either managing it or raising it. Um, you suddenly sound like a Im really important person. I mean, I mean, so, so when you were appointed, all of a sudden those colleagues that weren't as nice were they suddenly? Everyone's really very nice to me now. It's amazing. Yeah, it's it's really remarkable how nice everybody is. Um, no, it's you know, uh, the reason I took the job is because I, the, the festival played an important role in my life in my career. Um, I have run into more people since I did this job that have that came through Swanee. Just the other day, uh, the university was hosting um, public quartet. A big emerging string quartet in in the field, and their cellist walked up to a, the picture uh, and found himself in the music festival alumni picture from nineteen whatever, and he was there. Cool. Um, I ran into the dean of at, at Curtis at a, a conference last year, who came up to our booth like practically in tears about his experience at Swanee and how important it was to him to do it. So that's kind of why I did it, right? And it's turned out to be like way more rewarding than I thought it was going to be. Um, and I have a great team and we have an awesome managing director and, and a great faculty and, and great staff. And so it's, you know, it's could be worse, right? I mean, there are worse yeah. jobs in the world than a music festival. You know, super does, cool. does Mason help? Do they give you, because I mean. I, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I, I think do that. They give, they give you any time to do it? Release time? How do I answer this? I'll get rid of it if you don't like it. <laughs> no, no, no. I can, I can answer it. I mean, yes, I, uh, I can answer it in this way very clearly. Um, absolutely. Um, Mason is very supportive of my work with the music festival, and the music festival is very supportive of my continuing to work at Mason. Right. Our arts management program at George Mason, my entire, almost the entire staff for the music festival in the summer uh, who are in artistic service roles are from that program. So we're arts management grad students are getting a chance to work at Swanee. Um, we recruited one of their grads who was our office manager. She's now doing her master's at Mason, yeah. you know, in arts management. Um, obviously, kids come through the music festival who then come and audition for GMU. Yeah. Um, that's been happening for a while with percussion, and it's starting to happen in other 
on other instruments because I have a bit of a larger role in that. Well, I have quite a bit of a larger role with the music festival now, so I can do that. Um, so yeah, Mason is cool. very, very supportive. Very there's, cool. there's no issue. Um, I was just imagine, yeah. imagining one of my colleagues, if they were to suddenly become, I mean, that's such just the amount of time that must. Yeah. It's take. a lot of time. <laughs> just, I mean, our, yeah. our, our young listeners, especially, I mean, I just can't, I can't imagine it's adding lot. that yeah. to, to anyone's, anyone's amount of work they're already doing. But I imagine that, you know, the, the school is looking at it saying, well, man, this is such a huge feather in our cap. This is really cool. <laughs> And also, we hope you have time for it, you know. Yeah, no, it, it, they are. And I think part of it, you know, is you talk about younger, you know, whoever's, you know, listening to this, the, you know, um, communication is really important. And every step of the way with, you know, the dean and the director of the School of Music at Mason, like I told them I was offered this job. I showed them the contract. We talked nice. about how, you know, it was it was always a very open conversation with both institutions and, and actually the director of the school of music at mason her son came to swanee my first summer on the on the as director and and so she came down to visit she met with the dean there you know so there's just been good yeah. communication and you know an understanding that when i'm out let's say i go like this week i'm doing some recruiting for the for swanee right i'll be in in texas i'm doing classes i mean of course i'm going to talk about mason when i'm there right like there's no question that i'm going to talk about my university and if i'm doing something for mason it's logical that Swanee's going to come up. Here's a good example. And this podcast is a good example of that, right? Like sure. I'm talking about both places where I work. So as long as I don't screw something up dramatically, which so far I haven't, we'll see how it goes, but uh, you know, it should work pretty well. I think one of y'all have a question. Yeah. So when you were talking about programming, you mentioned like the difficulties of programming percussion chamber music. And one thing I th a lot of us are fans of here is uh, mix chamber music. Right. Um, obviously, the bar talk comes up a lot. And we have many inside jokes about that here. Um, but do you have any other favorite works that you as faculty or, you know, as student performances as well of uh, mixed chamber ensembles with percussion? Yeah, I mean, we did the, the bar talk last summer, actually, um, which was super fun. And um, it was the John Tafoya. John Tafoya was one of our guest uh, percussion faculty. So John and I played bar talk and it was super fun. And that's probably the third time that John and I played it together. I played it some other times. Of course, he's played it a ton of times. So it was super fun. Um, we did the Shostakovich uh, 15th Symphony, the chamber version of that in the same week, which in retrospect was a little intense um, for everybody involved, but was super cool. Um, so th those work really well. There's a, a, a great, you know, the, the challenge in addition to programming, just the logistical challenges of percussion is that as familiar as many of these works are to us, to other instrumentalists, they aren't, right? So I could walk in and say, hey, I want to play this piece. And, you know, no, fortunately for the Bartok Sonata, you know, John and I there, and then one of the two pianists had actually played it with Tafoya and I in a, at a previous thing. So mm -hmm. three, two thirds of us had, or three, whatever, three of the four of us in the group, I'm not going to. Oh, ask. so it's easy at that point. At that, right, right. It was the, <laughs> the, for the one poor pianist that didn't, hadn't played it before, right? But but she she was great and and so but the but the challenge isn't so much um, finding something for us to play. It's like hey hey violin or string quartet or clarinet player, will you learn this piece that you may never play again? Yeah. You know, and it's super difficult and it's it's really thorny contemporary music. So you know we we've had success with there's a, a really great piece by um, Libby Larson called Corker. Yeah. for percussion and clarinet yeah. um and that works really well chad burrow and i played that several times there he's played it a bunch of other places um so the trick is finding music that that will work and then also when you start pro and this is going to sound like really i don't know snotty and obnoxious but when you start trying to compare the music that we have available to us as percussionists with like you know a, a schubert octet you know it starts to get really yeah. tough to make the argument to yeah. A string player or a string faculty, hey, don't play, you know, the Schumann piano quintet because you're going to play this really new modern contemporary piece with me that you're never, ever going to play again. But you've all played this other piece so many times. So you could rehearse it twice and have an awesome performance. Right. Or you could rehearse this piece 15 times with us. So I, I'm not criti I mean, I'm not being critical of anything, yeah. but, but that's the, a challenge. The challenges are, are challenge. really. So I think as as percussionists, what we probably need to do is like lean into programming this kind of stuff significant contemporary repertoire for mixed instrument like much earlier in the process so that our students are have have played all of that by the time they're teaching at festivals or at universities because i still think there's a big gap between 
you know, the, the somewhat insulated world that we live in as percussionists and what we think is easy and what yeah. the rest of classical music looks at this and goes like, whoa, you know, this is, I'm, I'm never going to play this. I can't, I don't, I'm, I have no need to play because I'm never going to see it again. No. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Ksenia, I think. Um, yes. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, the administrative role that you have, because I think it's, it is really exciting, but it is a way in which you have the power to, to sculpt so many people's experiences. And what I've seen on the website, you know, that the 2019 season had significant increase in enrollment and earned revenue and annual giving and the first significant uh, endowment gift, yeah. right, in over a decade, which is all a really, really big deal to do, especially in your first year. And I was just wondering, you know, what prepared you for this kind of role? You have to have so many capabilities of having conversations at different levels to speak to students, faculty, sure. and all the potential donors and supporters. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, yeah, just share um, with us. Uh yeah, totally. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's a little crazy when you think about when you, when you hear someone tell it back to you, it's a little <laughs> bit more intense than when you're actually thinking about it, living it yourself. You're like, oh, yeah, all of that happened. Um, I, I think for me, the I think for me, the thing that has been interesting about my career trajectory is that so many of the opportunities that I've had that didn't have to do with strictly playing percussion, um, but opportunities either I created or people recognized that I might be useful to, to, to collaborate with on this, um, prepared me for something that I didn't know was coming, mm -hmm. which is kind of unusual in the world that I think maybe I was coming from as a player. And this may be true of all of us. Like if you're going to school to, to take orchestra auditions or to have a career as an orchestral percussionist, maybe is a better way to say it. That's a very set path. Right. And it's very easy to see how that path is going to gonna unfold or not unfold. Right. There's a certain group of people you study with. There's a certain number of places you go to study in the summer. There's resources for you to access how to prepare an orchestra audition. And then, you know, you go and you do it and you keep doing it and you refine it. And maybe you get a job and maybe you don't. But it's a fairly I mean, I'm being very dismissive of a lot of the struggles, but the path is really is, is well laid out. Right. And it's the same with university positions. Right. Like. There are boxes you check, there are programs you people, there are people that you probably need to study with if you really want to get a university job, um, or at least you need to have on your resume. But then there's all this other stuff <laughs> that happens out there. And I think that those are the things that um, you have to experience to, to prepare for whatever else it might be. So I learned how to raise money because, um, and I'm still learning how to raise money. And I want to be very clear that like I am in no way like some sort of grand guru of anything when it comes to fundraising. I mean, it's just, I've, I've had some good experiences with it and I've had some sort of understanding of it, but I'm still very much trying to figure it all out. But when I got to Mason, there was very little scholarship money for the school and very little for percussion. And that really, I don't know, how is this like a PG-13 pocket? That like really pissed me off that I was losing students because I didn't have money. And so I decided I was going to go raise money because I was mad that I didn't have money. And thankfully, I worked at a school and had an administration that was very much supportive of faculty taking initiatives outside of their area. And lots of schools don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of you you teach percussion at the school and you sit in your room and you teach percussion and stay away from development and advancement and all of that strategic planning, strategic planning, all yeah, of those things. You stay yeah, away from all that. Don't Mason is not like that at all, which which is was good for me, you know, um, so I, I won't go through this whole thing, but like I figured out how to get a room named after somebody in our percussion studio is now named after Fred Begun, who was the timpanist cool. in the National Symphony for many years. And Freddie was a friend and we got to talking about his legacy and through many discussions and his family and various other folks, we created a scholarship program for percussion students. Mm -hmm. So I figured out how to like start a, you know, how do you have that conversation with somebody about their, their legacy? And what that really means is their legacy when they're not here. Yeah. You know, and that's an interesting and difficult conversation to have. Um, but it doesn't have to be if you know how to do it. And so I saw my dean, the dean at the time, have that conversation so masterfully, right? Because I was in the room and I watched him do it. And it was like this really brilliant sort of, you know, Jedi mind trick, you know, <laughs> you'll give us your money. You know, and it was like really, but it was done in such an elegant and beautiful mm -hmm. way 
that it was it was really interesting to me to see how that was done. Well, um, it's amazing what one like assistant ship will do. Yeah, you know, of like course. if you have, and what I think we're very lucky here. And I mean, it, it's amazing when I can advertise our our band assistant ships, mm -hmm. full ride plus stipend for a master student. It just the the amount of people who now audition here, sure, of course, and like see the program and see what's going on. I mean, you could make a very easy argument just to say this this assistant ship does so much more than fund one kid <laughs> right? because right. we can get all these other students sure. here. To, and they might not take the see... assistant ship, but they might come anyway because right. they're very, once they're here, they're like, man, this is hip. I, right. I, if I don't get the assistant ship, I'm still going to come to the school. Yeah, or, or, exactly. or at least word spreads about what, this, right. what the right. studio is like. And, and yeah, yeah, it's just, that's inspiring. So that was one, one thing. And then, you know, um, my first sort of experience building, creating a program in the summer was actually with John Tafoya at the university of Maryland when John was there and, and I was teaching at a, I just gotten out of school. I was doing a thing, a gig in the summer that I really, really, really didn't like to do. So to be honest, it was just out of necessity. I was like, I cannot possibly imagine teaching in this program again. I'm going to quit music and run down the street screaming, <laughs> or I'm going to see if John wants to do something at Maryland. Right. So, I mean, like there's a, there's much more to the story than that, to that. But that was the first time that I dealt with corporate sponsors and I really learned how to deal with that. And I dealt with guest artists and I made mistakes you know, putting people in hotels that I shouldn't have put them in and, you know, sort of figured out how you deal with, you know, deal with artists in that way. And and it was a great learning environment, having no idea that I was then suddenly going to be dealing 10 years later with, you know, management companies and conductors. You think, you know, you think percussionists are tricky, like you deal with, <laughs> you know, Opus 3 management and conductors and they have to have this kind of room in the car. I mean, it's like a whole other universe. Yeah. And to to not have had that experience prior would have left me really in the weeds for this job. But I didn't know 10 years ago that that was preparing me for this. And so I think students should probably keep a, pay close attention to what they're doing now because they may very well be doing it what, you know, doing it later yeah. at a much higher level, hopefully. Well, and it reminds me, you reminded me of something that um, helped me out. Well, Ross Carr from ICE. Oh, yeah. In, in International Contemporary There's Ensemble. a great example. Yeah. So, so he, and I, and I feel like other people on the podcast have, have said percussion can lead into these more sure. organizational type positions. Yeah. And when we say, like, how did you end up the director of this giant festival? It's uh, a lot of stories start with, well, when you're a percussionist, there's all this extra planning right. you have to do, and there's all this extra organizing you have to do, and uh, getting your instrument there is suddenly a big deal, and so on and so forth. Even yeah. even with just in the confines of school, right. getting your instrument to the right place, uh, yeah, it takes some planning. Well, know? and 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 so at Mason, I was asked for a number of years to to sort of oversee and lead the recruitment efforts for the school of music. Mm -hmm. So not just for percussion, but for the whole school. So that was the first time I ever dealt with recruiting string players, right? Mm -hmm. And recruiting vocalists. And it's a whole, I mean, again, it's a whole different conversation of what those students care about or music tech students, regardless of their instrument, right? right? So when you're sitting in an office and you're, you know, I would wax on and on about this wonderful, you know, faculty we have and how great players they are. And they would go, yeah, so um, tell me about the tech in your office, you know, and I'm like, I I don't know, this is like some mics or something. I have no idea. Like, so, you know, having to learn this whole other aspect of it. So that was part of what led me to be in the position to feel comfortable about taking over a festival where you obviously a big aspect of the job is recruiting um, because I had that experience. I don't have that position anymore at Mason, which is which is good for lots of reasons. But um, it taught me a lot about, you know, how to deal with talking again, talking to string players, talking to. What do, what do brass players really care about when it comes to choosing between, you know, if they're a pre-college kid, Interlochen and Idlewild and us, and if they're a college kid, you know, Eastern and Brevard, because there are some places that we're going to lose the argument no matter what we do, right? Mm -hmm. So if a student gets into Tanglewood or Aspen, sure. God bless you, you know, have a great time, <laughs> Harry, but we're not, you know, but then sure, so, sure. sometimes it does come down to a negotiation between us and, you know, maybe two or three other places. So what is that thing that's going to get a kid to come to Swanee over, when I say kid, I could be talking about a, you know, a graduate student come to Swanee over someplace else. Um, and you have to know the answer to that instrument specific, because it's completely different what a string player cares about in a summer program than what a, a and even within strings, like cellists care a lot more about orchestra than violinists do. 
as a general experience, right? Yeah. Like bass players are way more interested in knowing what the orchestra rep is than viola players are. Viola players want to know chamber music, right? That's where they, string upper string players, just that's all they care about, string quartet or, or concertos. So you talk to them about the concerto competition and the chamber music program, they're all in. I talk, start talking to them about conductors and Mahler One and Symphony Fantastique, and they're like, yeah, whatever. Right. I don't, I, well, yeah, Interesting. That's cool. yeah. yeah. Which is something I had no concept of. Yeah. Really, prior to coming into these other things. Never thought about that from a recruitment angle, because of course I've never thought about recruiting string players. But yeah, it's <laughs> like you're you you know you bump into a group of vocalists in the hallway. They're like right. incredibly chatty, and you bump into a group of brass players in the hallway. They're mm -hmm. uh, Chat, farting and burping. Yeah, right. They're like <laughs> delete that. They're, they're, they're like totally have a different different vibe about it. Right, them. right, right. Hey, well, let, let's give John a little break from talking. Carly, I think you bumped into something cool this week that you shared with us about developing habits, right? Yeah. So recently, I heard um, there's an NPR show called Hidden Brain, and, and it's a podcast too, and and it's worth checking out. An episode called Creatures of Habit. Um, the show is hosted by Shankar Vedantam, and the guest on this episode is, her name is Wendy Wood, and she's a professor of psychology and business at University of Southern California, and she's also the author of a book called Good Habit, Bad Habits, The Science of Making Positive Changes That Stick. Um, and, and why I thought to share it with you all on the podcast is because I found myself referring to this podcast episode for you know, in lessons with students for various things, like how do I develop a better better practice habit and just say, hey, check out this episode. Um, so the overall message of the, this episode is that building good habits or getting rid of bad habits um, is more effective for long-term change than like just simply having strong willpower or sheer determination. Um, and what, what's discussed is that willpower or self-control can instigate a short-term change, you know, something Maybe maybe you do it once or a couple of times, but it doesn't always lead to lasting long-term change. Um, so it's really the habits that you form, um, or or in other words, not having to think so much about making a decision, kind of being on autopilot that leads to lasting change in any behavior. Um, so what, what I think we all need to take a look at is what can we do to build the best habits to accomplish our long-term goals? Um, so there are a couple of examples that were discussed in this episode. One is um, there was an office building, I think it was in Seattle, um, and they said the, the design of the office building is that you walk into the door and there are stairs that are visible from the entrance and easy to access. And there's also an elevator, but to get to the elevator, you have to do something like press a button with a wheelchair on it, and then a door opens to a room with an elevator. So the easiest thing, the path of least resistance, is just go up the stairs, even though that's you know more physical effort on our part. And what they found was that Two thirds of people walking into the office building would just use the stairs instead. And of course, that has positive impacts on health and activity and probably mood and all kinds of different things. Um, so another example that's discussed on the show is uh, an ad campaign to help people eat fruits and vegetables. Um, it's the five a day campaign that that was talked about um, that I think was happening like during the 90s. Um, and what they said was before the campaign, only 8% of the U.S. population knew that you should aim to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And five years later, after the campaign, over a third of Americans knew about this. They're like, OK, this is what I should be doing. But actual behavior didn't change at all before the campaign. 11% of Americans were actually eating five fruits or vegetables and after still only 11% were. And that's because our, our eating habits are so rooted in, in just, this is what I always do. It's just, it's habitual. Um, so the, the kind of, the kind of, the kind of, I think, message to take from this is even knowing about like knowledge isn't going to change long-term behavior e either. Um, couple other examples of kind of automatic or more passive decisions that we make is something like we all know on Netflix or YouTube, like the next video or the next episode just comes on. And if you don't do anything, you're like, oh, I just watched four episodes of this show or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, or they, they yeah, talk to you about the, the <laughs> at McDonald's, like the classic line, would you like fries with that? And the easiest thing to say is yes. Um, so an, another thing, another thing that's talked about in this episode is the concept of friction. 
Um, and friction is kind of the term that they use for resistance. And um, usually what we do is we, we do the same things over and over again that are easier or fun um, and avoid things that are harder, or more challenging, or just less like we have to think about more. Um, so friction can be used to to make habits easier. Like one thing that the that the author of the book Wendy Wood she talks about towards the end of the episode she, that she used to have a hard hard time getting up early in the morning to go running, and so she actually slept in her running clothes to make that one little thing of like, oh, what a drag! I gotta get up and put my running clothes on and get out the door. No, it's just unreal. get up. And go, oh, yeah, which is crazy. Cool. I thought about like, could I ever do that? No, I don't think so. So I don't think I care about anything enough. Sleep holding your mallets. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, I'm, I'm gonna practice more. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a it's a joke, but I I was thinking about this, and I'm I'm pretty sure that I heard about that that Keith Aleo was the one that told me this. I think he said that he used to put symbols by the practice room door, so every time you leave, you have to practice symbols. Like you just have to do it. They're right there. You have to pick yeah. them up. Um, something it. like that, yep. just making it like so automatic. Yep. Um, yeah, and I, and, mm-hmm. yeah, go ahead. No, there's just some, there's some other great, I mean, we probably all know the power of habit, right? That book that's out there. Um, yeah, yeah, there's another one, um, a guy named James Clear is is the author. It's called Atomic Habits and he, it's sort of, it's not really, it's not a direct follow-up, but there's additional information about habit forming. So I, I make, I don't make my students do anything, but I encourage them to read the power of habit. We talk about it a lot in studio class. We talk about it probably they're probably annoyed with me about it but we talk about it a lot and then um atomic habits is really good because he he focuses specifically on this idea what they call habit stacking you know which is kind of what you're saying about the person sleeping in their running clothes like if you want to read more put a book on your pillow you know so you make your bed in the morning if you make your bed in the morning and then leave a book on your pillow and then at night when you go to bed it's like okay the book's right there you don't have to think about what you're doing or what you're reading um this i've heard the the gym clothes thing before i'm obviously not doing the gym clothes thing at the moment um maybe that's i should start wearing my running clothes to sleep at night but um yeah i think all of those things are are definitely the power of habit and atomic habits are two books that would be really useful if you're interested in that it idea reminds me a lot. We had the Boston Brass here and the horn player, who I, I don't remember his name, but he told a little story of when he was a kid and his teacher trying to get him to practice more. And he said, what do you do with your horn when you get home? And he said, oh, I just put the case down on the, you know, wherever on the ground by my shoes and carry on with my day. So like, OK, all I want you to do is instead of putting the horn case down, put it on your bed and open it. That's all I want you to do. And that's what started him practicing. It's like the Keith, Keith Aleo symbol story. It's like just making it right there in front of you changes a lot. Yeah. So what I, what I started naturally doing after listening to this is think about how do we relate this to building habits or maybe getting rid of like negative habits, bad habits that we have. Um, and I'm sure you all might have some ideas to, to jump in on too, but thinking about practice it, like make it easy to practice. Um, one thing too is is to schedule your practice. I say this to students all the time; they're sick of it. But schedule your practice time. Make it a time. What I do in my life it usually is I'll try to schedule a, a gap in my teaching schedule wherever I am, and I'm in a room with instruments, and that's my practice time. And that's so much easier for me than either get up extra early and try to do it before I leave to teach, or you know come home at the end of a long day and like, well, now I gotta practice after I do all the other things related to coming home. Um, so that's that's been a, a helpful one for me. But just like committing the time and being in a room with the instruments is is a really good thing. Anybody else have any any good strategies for committing to practice time? Well, I loved on just just speaking of the power of this, you'd think, well, wait a minute, you know, c- coming home, opening my horn case, what's the, or putting the symbols outside the door, like, okay, that might lead to a little bit more, but it can't lead to that much more. But one of the studies they talked about was how they lowered the amount of smoking in the United States. And I thought it was really profound. You can put out all the research in the world. You can put pictures on cigarette packets. You can, you know, put out all this information. But if you just get rid of cigarette vending machines like yeah. they did and just make them just a little less accessible, all of a sudden tons of people are, are quitting smoking. 
You know, it's it's not about knowing what's good for you. It's just about making it part of your day. You know you need to practice. You know you need to, but still you're not doing it. Yeah, it's just not it's not in your veins yet to to do it. It's not part of your day yet to do it. So if it can make people quit smoking, it's like think of what the opposite can can do for you. Right. Yeah. Another did thing I, that's Ben has something. Did, does it? I thought <laughs> you steam. I didn't steamroll. I said me. You said it after Casey. You already had your me. No. No. Anyone, that wasn't it. anyone that has no idea what we're talking about, we have a, we have a group like a chat that we use as we do the podcast. And if we have something to say, we type the word me. And it's just like like notoriously between Casey and me, like it's like the most frequent that when when I say me, Casey, and I, I used to do it to be it's fair, true. like way worse. It's true. Um, but yeah, like I'll, I'll type me, then Casey will start talking and we have all these jokes about getting steamrolled that no one listening has ever had any idea about <laughs> that. That's a thing. Someone out um, there is keeping score. I bet. I bet Mark Ford's keeping score. But how, how many times know? does Casey steamroll? But you know, the listener doesn't know. But I bet he's going to report on it. Sorry, someday. Carly. I, I didn't, I didn't want to steamroll you, Carly. Were, were, were you, were you finished with your, your bit? Cause I had something I wanted to add, but I didn't want to jump in the middle and start taking. How very your, your, polite your, of you. <laughs> Your, Go your ahead, friend, ben. ben. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I just had like three, two anecdotes and one actual thing to add here. One is uh, I saw this thing on Facebook the other day, and it, it, what Carly's talking about with practicing in the morning, it reminds me so much of I said, it said something like, the worst decision you will ever make as an adult is I'll get gas in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, you all know that <laughs> feeling of like, you know what, like I'm coming home at 10 o'clock tonight, my car's on empty, but I'll just get gas in the morning. And then, of course, that's inevitably like the morning that you're running late and like you barely have time to stop and get gas and it, it just ruins your morning. And I used to say like, oh, well, I'll schedule my first lesson at nine. And I'll get there at eight and practice. And now I do the opposite. Like I schedule the lesson early, leave an hour empty afterward. And it's like, well, what am I going to do now? I'm here. Um, and then we were, we were talking about um, the idea of like put the put the uh, book on your pillow at night so you read at night that sort of thing and I remember a while back I think it was a, a it was Rob Knopper was talking about it I don't remember if it was one of his videos or a blog entry or what um, but I, I, I've since graduate school I've used the, the idea of enablers um, and usually that is a term that's I think used with like drug addicts uh, and like you know like an enabler right. is your friend that's out. I want to see where this is going. But I think positive enablers. Are you okay, Ben? Yeah. <laughs> but I think there can also be positive enablers, like having your sticks re readily accessible. And actually, like on all of my practice room doors here, I have signs posted that, you know, it's like the standard, like, don't leave your stuff in the practice rooms, don't sleep in the practice rooms, that sort of thing. Uh, but I don't ever complain about anyone leaving their sticks in a practice room because I'm like, you know what, if, like, if you're more likely to go practice because you've left your sticks in a room, um, so be it. And then Carly can also attest that I, I was always that guy. Uh, <laughs> and then I, my final little, this was actually the anecdote I wanted to get to, um, th this, uh, this podcast that, that we listened to, this, uh, I thought it was very good and it brought up a lot of very good points, but I wanted to add one thing to it. And that is that I think it's important at regular intervals, a set interval to evaluate yourself. Um, and so like I have many things in my own life right now I'm trying to work on and improve. Um, and I don't know why I just decided this year, every single month at the end of the month, I'm going to give myself a report card. And I did my first one, uh, I, was it two days ago, what, a, a couple days ago. Um, and I evaluated myself on artistic health, mental health, physical health and financial health um i want to see this I, every every co-host does this now and i want to have these turned in every <laughs> month. as long as you're guessing not, not only and again, I, I, want yeah, so I, I assigned myself like a, a solid letter grade but then i also wrote like a, a little like just like a paragraph summary of like what what went well what didn't go well and for me for example under the category of financial health I feel like all of us, I'm trying to save some money. And I realized like I eat out all the time, um, you know, like especially we have like a group chat with some of my colleagues. Hey, does anyone want to get lunch? I always say yes, <laughs> even though we always have planned to go to lunch on Wednesday as our day to go lunch. Like Tuesday, we'll get a text and then Tuesday night, I'll be busy till five o'clock. And then all of a sudden, like it's like I'm not going to go home and cook dinner now. Like might as well just pick up something on the way. And all of a sudden I'm eating out you know, 10 plus times a week, not 
super expensive meals, partially because I live in Stephenville, Texas here. There's not all that much expensive food here. Um, but so I, and it was kind of like what Carly was talking about or this blog entry was talking about of like uh, pairing habits. And so every single day I, I eat lunch and whether I eat in or out, that doesn't matter. But my goal is every single day at lunch, I have to decide what I'm doing for dinner. And that way I'll make a conscious de decision at noon so that it doesn't get to be 7.30 p.m. and I haven't thought about dinner yet and I'm just running to Subway picking up something instead of, you know, cooking something at home. So those were my, like, wow. takeaways from it. Good for you, man. That's that's so... Oh, God, yeah. yeah, that's impressive. Like that's a very examined life you're leading. Yeah, yeah. like way to go. Like, once a month is like a good... I mean, it takes me 15, 20 minutes. I, I don't want to do this on, like, on a daily or weekly basis. And I think it's actually probably less productive because you don't see you know, habits forming a trajectory. But like this month, I like my practice habits were were okay. I got back into the swing of things after winter break, but I was like, no, that's not, I'm not where I need to be there. So yeah, it was, it was really enlightening. Kind of funny that all that was in my mind. And then I listened to this podcast and it was like, oh, there it is. That's exactly what I was thinking about already. Wow. Well, Ben, you'll you'll have to fill us in in a couple of months if you're, if the habit <laughs> stuck working. and led to long-term change. Yeah. But when, like, here's like, when's the last time you got a report card on anything? Right. Like, yeah, of course. Other than maybe your health, if you went to the doctor and they told you you, you did eat better or something. But yeah. So no, it was, good, for it was, good, for, good for you. That's that takes a level of discipline, I think. Like, that's clearly a good idea. I, I man, I'm so bad at doing things like that for myself. No, yeah, the, the accountability habit, buddy. Hard. No, the habit thing is, is, um, I'm trying to think how to say this. So, yeah, I mean, I, I used to smoke and I quit smoking and that, I mean, year, a long time ago, um, I can't use it as an excuse for my otherwise poor health now, but I, I, at the time I did, but you know, you don't, when you, when you do that, when you quit smoking, you go, you realize what you connect that smoking to, right? Mm -hmm. So like every time I would get in the car, I'd have a cigarette. Every time I would pick up the phone, you know, if the phone would ring, I, you know, I would immediately have a cigarette the first thing in the morning. If I was writing or, I mean, I used to do more you know, the kind of work I would do or in between students or every three or four students. And so you have to come up with something else to do mm -hmm. to fill in that time. So you're not so, you know, just sit there obsessively thinking about it. Um, so that idea of triggers and like using other habits or other things that you could replace with with the bad habit. In that case, like the really, really bad habit, you know, it's one thing not to practice. It's another thing that, you know, to smoke. And there's all these other, you know, there's all these reasons. And like you said, all the health reasons and all but none of that was the reason why I, I was actually ultimately able to stop to doing yeah, it and why, but, how most people do it. I've heard like the, the thing about smoking is like, it's not that you enjoy smoking. It's that you like, it's nice to take an eight minute break every hour and breathe. Yeah. Like, what's well, and it used to be really social. I mean, you know, right. I, as the, what I think is maybe the oldest person of this little quartet at the moment, like, or what are we five, five of us? Um, like it used to be very social. Like I was in school and, there were a ton of people that smoked. And so we'd all go outside Juilliard and we'd all sit out there and we would all smoke and it was fun and it was social. By the end, I was literally by myself <laughs> huddled right. outside a building like a jerk, you know? Um, yes. Like a chimney to answer that, that question about the person you asked about. Oh, of course um, you would, but I, I'm not going to say who it is, but yes, I'll say it where you think I would. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but anyway, like that was part of it was the social aspect of it. And then, I realized when I'm sitting like in the one room in my house, I would let myself smoke in alone mm -hmm. and no, or I'd go outside and I would be at a big table of people having dinner and I would be the only one going to the bar to have a cigarette. Like that suddenly became not a thing. So yeah. anyway, that, there's, when, there's a whole when other I, story. I, I never was a heavy smoker, but when I smoked, it was socially and it was with friends at yeah. school and it yeah. was like practice break. And yeah, it was, um, he yeah, never I wore black was, nail polish either. Sorry, I'm all I'm like obsessed with this chat thing over here now. Yeah, Sorry, well, yeah, but no, I think it's good. The you know, you know the, one little, um, I guess one more thing to relate to this. I maybe have told this on the podcast before, but I played that Italy PAS, uh, Italy Progressive Arts Society gig one of those years and uh, played a little solo recital. And um, this very not kind lady came to me afterwards and said, Great, great performance. Your posture is terrible. Uh, cause you know, you hunch over the snare drum yeah, or, yeah. you know, you lean down or whatever. And, and she says, it's so hard to watch you. And she gave me this whole session 
in another room about posture and how to stand and what what to do down here so you stand taller and all, all you know just just good general stuff and regarding habits she said the way you fix this is buy one of those little thing of stickers like little red dot stickers and places you frequent in your house the coffee pot red sticker the mirror red sticker um, the where, wherever you go, your computer a red sticker. Every time you see a red sticker, you're just gonna do this little adjustment that I reminded you of. Yeah, and it really works. You know, it is just this um, you know conditioning. You see this red sticker, you do this response, and the red sticker because it's there, it sort of keeps you obligated and kind of holds you to it and i see the red sticker and it reminds me of her and how she donated her time to fix yeah. this thing for me and i if i didn't do it i felt guilty you know she did it didn't charge me gave me all hmm. this all this time and everything for free and i would i felt bad if i didn't do it so it really worked and i, I think it did actually help and now i do have a, a somewhat you know what was a problem like is better now Cool. Yeah. Hey, so let's um we're about to wrap here and cool. we're releasing on February 13th. So I'm going to do my little what happened on February 13th thing. In 1914, the American Science Society of Composers, Authors and Publishers, also known as ASCAP, forms in New York City. So ASCAP's probably the the most known PRO out there, performance rights organization. And it's kind of crazy to think back, you know, radio really got big in the 20s and to think it was just the wild, wild west. If you owned the record, you were free to play it as much as you wanted and you were just making money attracting listeners off of other people's work and not compensating them for it. And someone had to step in. And of course, that was that was ASCAP. And it was uh, Irving Berlin was one of the earliest members, uh, John Philip Sousa, one of the earliest members. They kept raising their rates. I mean, always trying to give composers and publishers, lyricists more, more money for their work. And what's interesting, for 11 months, January to the end of October, I believe in the 30s, they tried to double their rates, I guess, again, according to what I read. And all the radio broadcasters boycotted anything associated with ASCAP for 10 months. Uh, excuse me, 11 months. It's a lot of revenue missed by all these authors and composers. So you can imagine what counter PRO came into existence during those 10 months. Anybody? The two big ones are ASCAP and... BMI. Yeah, you, you got it, Ben. Yeah, that's right, BMI. Uh, and yeah, because then you just said it too. So yeah, BMI came into existence during that 10 month boycott of ASCAP performers and authors. Also on February 13th, 1961, the first performance of one of, I think, man, one of the funnest things to play is Bernstein's Symphonic Dances from West Side Story. That was a first performance and conducted by Lucas Foss, 1961. Also in 1961, Henry Rollins is born. Anybody a Henry Rollins fan? John? Fan's a strong word, but I know okay. who he is. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Cool. I mean, you know, of course, he started Black Flag in 1981, one of the earlier punk rock bands out there. And uh, since then, I mean, does just a lot of human rights activism, um, has kind of a stand-up comedy slash uh, speech tour that he he's given for for years and of course lots of uh, human rights donations and campaigns and activities and yeah henry rollins is is interesting i think and in 1883 wagner dies so that also happened today on february 13th and that's about all i found for february 13th well hey thank you all so much ben ksenia carly and man, John Kilkenny, it's great to like. Thanks a lot. Thanks Appreciate for like it, yeah. literally walked in the door, sat down, and did the podcast. Yeah, it's so. my pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. Like a pro. Yeah. Yep. All right. Hey, everybody. We'll catch you on uh, what the heck two seventeen.